Hello, and welcome back to the Science Center in Ithaca, New York. My name is Colin, I'm the curator of live exhibits, and I am here to give you another tour of the animal room. We are currently looking at our African clawed frog exhibit. You can see our big albino swimming by, they just saw me come up. They're seeing me move around, they're excited, hoping for some food. Fortunately, I did not take the time to dig up any worms for them, so we won't feed them today, but I thought if they give us a good look, it's going to show you how their feet have evolved to help them eat. One of the more comical things I find, oh, scared that one, about these guys. Try to get a good view here. Maybe this guy is showing. Ah, here. Well, so these guys, their feet have evolved to be rather than flat, as if they would put them on the ground, seeing as they would never be putting them on the ground because they're entirely aquatic frogs. Okay, and focus there. No focus. Nah. Well, their feet have evolved to be turned in rather than flat down. And that helps them when food comes along. Maybe this albino will show it for us. Their feet are turned in so that when food comes along and they grab it and try to shove it into their mouth, their feet are turned in to make that job easier. These guys are kind of grotesque eaters. They grab whatever they can and just shove it right in. Many frogs are this way. I've talked in the past about how bullfrogs often eat green frogs. And probably big green frogs also eat small bullfrogs. In many parts of the world, it is definitely a frog eat frog world. So those are our African clawed frogs. I think we'll head around this way for right now. If I can manage my cords. There we go. Here, back to our bicolor dart frogs. These guys are always fun. Just sit around in a group, staring up. It always makes me think it's like a there. Praying to the fruit fly gods to deliver them fruit flies. Got another one hiding back there. It's hard to keep this glass clean. It's such a moist, wet environment like the rainforest they live in. And there's always algae and bacteria, scum and slime that's growing up on this glass. We are constantly having to wipe it clean so we can see in there. Up here, I don't know if we'll be able to see it if the lights would be too blinding, too much humidity. Perhaps we have a drip system set up. Not really seeing it so well. You can maybe be able to see some water shooting out behind that pothos leaf back there. We have this drip system, so the back wall is constantly being dripped with moisture, as if there's water seeping from the cliff. And that's what helps grow the thick, lush moss on the back wall. It makes it look like quite a nice, authentic rainforest environment. We try to maintain as many live plants in the exhibits as we can. Our collection is here to teach people about the wild environments and habitats that these amazing creatures come from. And by having live plants in the exhibits, it very much helps give a better, better sense of the environments they come from, the habitats they come from. Oh, 
Well, you'll have to excuse me. I'm doing some cord management. My live stream camera is tethered by an Ethernet cable. So I'm constantly having to manage my cords in order to get around this room. Jeez Louise. Next, we've got our speed, ri Spanish rib newts. I showed these guys off on a tour the other day, and I was discussing. No, oh, come on, focus, work with me here. I think I've got the glare in focus, but unfortunately, I'm having trouble getting the Spanish rib newt in focus. Can I keep it? Ah. Keep being focused on that glare. And I won't complain too much because I do love having this window in the room that creates all this glare. Gives us some good natural light. But there you can see the spots on its side. That's where its ribs could come jutting through its skin if a predator attempted to grasp it tight. That is their main defense mechanism. They're, like most newts, they're probably mildly toxic as well, so they probably wouldn't taste very good. They've got those sharp ribs that could poke through. And I was giving a private tour recently, virtually, and I was asked if it hurts them when that happens. And I'll admit, I've, we've never had it happen here. No one has ever tried to predict our Spanish rib newts or grab them firmly. So their ribs have never come jutting through their skin, as far as I know. But I would imagine, like most newts and salamanders, they're probably able to heal quite quickly from something like that. It's far safer to risk a little prick in the side than it is to get gobbled down by a predator. Let me turn you all this way. Plants in the windows there. Here, I'll bring you over to our seahorse tank. We've got one right over here in the corner. Let's see if I can get a good, good view on her. And I've got some shrimp queued up. Some nice shrimp, which is what these guys' favorite food is. There we go. So if I can get this camera to stay here. Perfect. So the seahorse is hiding just right there. That's her back. She's attached to, she's hitched to this bit of seagrass here. They have a prehensile tail so they can grab on with their tail and they hang on to something and she's hanging out here. The head is facing the other direction. Here if you look in the reflection you can see her there. That's her face turning the other way. Let me go ahead and put some mices in the tank and see if she's hungry. If she is, she'll smell them right away and eagerly start moving around trying to grab them. Uh, get these shrimp in here. Floating by. We'll see if she's hungry or not. It's just been a few hours since her last meal. So I wouldn't be surprised if she's not too hungry right now. Well, she's not looking so hungry. Let me grab this camera and I'll swing it around and give you all a good view of her before we move on. I'll come over to the side of the tank here. Oh, look at that. There she is. What a gorgeous animal. Seahorses are pretty incredible. They've got those prehensile tails. They've got independently moving eyes. They suck their food in fairly fast and violently like a vacuum cleaner. That's a little different from chameleons, but chameleons shoot their tongues out. These guys have lots of, they share lots of traits with chameleons. Totally different habitats, totally different animals, but they each have evolved, adapted to have 
evolved to have those adaptations that help them survive in their environments. A prehensile tail to hang on and not get washed away in the currents. Those independently moving eyes to see little critters as they're moving around and be able to gobble them up. Seahorses also have bony plates on their skin to help keep them safe and protected. The, group they, the genus they come from, excuse me, I believe it's the family. The family they come from, Signacidae, is, um, it means fierce jaw. These guys have that long snout, which a normal fish would have a mouth along there that would open up. These guys just have a simple little flap right on the front. You can almost see it flapping away there as she moves her gills and breathes. Like a vacuum cleaner, they just expand their head and create a vacuum and suck their food in the, through that narrow snout. They're super fun creatures. It's fun to have them back here at the site, isn't it? Had them long ago when I first started here. That group aged out, and we decided to give them a go again. Give it another try. We miss our toadfish. She was a really wonderful fish. Had her for a long, long time. Here we're onto our reef tank. We have a new reef tank down in the basement to replace this one. This one sprung a leak a while back. Got a generous gift from the Chemung Canal Trust Company to help renovate this tank. So we have a new one down in the basement. If COVID hadn't struck and if I hadn't injured my arm, we would have already swapped out these tanks. I'm looking forward to that project. It's going to be a big one, and it'll certainly be stressful trying to move all these sensitive creatures out of this tank and into the new one. But I have faith we'll be able to do it, and we'll be growing a new reef pretty soon. Here you can see down at the bottom of the tank, we just celebrated Endangered Species Day just last Friday. Here, I'm pointing out there. That is our Bengai Cardinal Fish. Bengai Cardinal Fish are endangered. And there's a pretty neat story about them. They come from just a tiny range in the Pacific Ocean, Southeast Asia. And the Bengais uh, were discovered not very long ago. There are other cardinal fish that have been known of for a long time, but the Bengais uh, have not been known of for all that long. And they're really pretty fish, so when they were first discovered, people in the pet trade were quite excited about them. And they unfortunately went out and over-harvested Bengai cardinal fish, trying to collect too many of them for the pet trade. Coupled between that heavy selective pressure on their population by hobbyists and collectors, uh, coupled with the habitat loss that virtually all reefs are experiencing now due to warming waters, climate change, the Bengai's population crashed pretty significantly. They've become endangered. When that happened, there was a huge outcry and there was a great effort done to try to protect their habitat. And it turns out that they're actually quite easy to breed in captivity. So once that was discovered, then folks... Ah, awful focus. I'm get you better focus there. Once people realized that their populations had crashed, there were great efforts put in to protecting their habitat, breeding them in captivity, and I believe a number of places participated in, in breeding animals to then re-release back into the wild. And so through that great effort of stopping the wild collecting, doing captive breeding, and, and protecting habitat, my understanding is their population has well rebounded now and is, is much more stable and healthy. So it's a really fun story that it shows sort of many of the ills to reef keeping and collecting, but it was also those the same groups of people um, and their efforts realizing that they were threatened to help bring them back. So it's both a story that illustrates the good and the bad of the pet trade and the things that can happen. 
So that's a fun fish, one of the three endangered species that we maintain at the Science Center here. Okay, let's move on and take a look at our beautiful lionfish here. Always get awful glare in this tank with that beaded lizard tank behind us. Let's take a look here at our gorgeous lionfish. Try to get rid of some of that glare. Lionfish are pretty spectacular fish. They are invasive in the Atlantic and causing horrible problems. But they're beautiful fish. There's a number of different species of lionfish. This is the red lionfish, Volatans. Yeah, these two is little fish, and they've grown significantly in the time we've had them. They'll still get quite a bit larger. And it looks like that lionfish can see its reflection, but we can only see that reflection because we're looking through one pane of glass at a perpendicular pane. The lionfish would not be able to see that reflection of itself. What gorgeous fish. I was lucky enough in my college years to travel to Zanzibar where I was able to see lionfish swimming in the water right off of the beach. I don't believe it was volatans, but I'm not sure what species it was. Those are on the back there. These spines on their dorsal ridge are have venom glands at the base of the spines, and they're hard and can prick you. My understanding is it can be as mild as a bee sting, but it can also be much more painful. So a lionfish is a venomous animal, and must be treated with respect. And then speaking of venomous animals, let me swing you all around over here. Is another venomous animal. This is our Mexican beaded lizard. See, I always, guy, I don't know if it's a guy or girl. I don't know what gender this animal is. I actually always hope it's a female because they stay a little smaller than males. This guy always makes me laugh though because it looks like it's had a hard night of partying. It's always crashed out somewhere with its head sort of slung over and it's sleeping away. Life is good for it here at the Science Center. It might show up regularly, keeping it fat and happy. And it just spends a lot of time thermoregulating because it's exothermic. It, means it stays the temperature of its environment. So when it wants to be warm, it comes out in its bright UV spotlight like this. Soak up the rays, get some good UV to keep its bones strong, stay nice and warm. If it starts to get too warm, it'll creep back under its rock there and stay in the shade, cool off a bit. These guys do come from quite arid environments. But in order to keep it safe and healthy, we keep a water bowl in here. And it loves its water bowl. It regularly hops in that water bowl and takes a good soak. our beaded lizard. As far as I know, that is the only venomous lizard on exhibit in Tompkins County. I know there were a number of venomous snakes up at Cornell. In Reed's lab. Verlon Clark was here. I know he had a good collection of timber rattlesnakes. I'm not sure if those animals are around anymore. I know Verlon has moved on done some really neat research I found fascinating about rattlesnakes and some of their familiar, familial ties, showing that it seems that timber rattlesnakes may recognize, female rattlesnakes may recognize their female relatives. So that's our beaded lizard. 
fun venomous animal. Another one we have to be very careful around, take quite seriously. We have special procedures written for how to care for that animal to keep all of our staff safe, our staff and guests. They are not lethal to humans, and they can't kill a person, but they can make you wish you were dead. My understanding is that their bites are incredibly painful. Hopefully no one here will ever get the first-hand knowledge to find out about that. That's our being lizard. It looks a nice desert habitat there. Next we'll swing around, take a quick look at some of our cichlids. These are giraffe haps, Venustus. And then we got that glare again. There they are. They've got neat sort of giraffe spots on their sides, hence their common name. These guys, when I come over to feed them, they all get super excited and come some come out swimming to see me, and then when I come around with a camera, they all get camera shy and swim away. That animal there is actually an albino. I forget which species off the top of my head. Very unlikely to find an albino in the wild. That light, light white coloration make them easy pickings for a predator. Um, oh, there goes one of our lemon drops zooming by. See another one hiding over here. These guys, being little fish, have to stay hidden away in the this, the, this isn't rock work, in the woodwork here. To keep larger predators from eating them. These guys don't realize there are no larger predators in here, but they do see big giant beasts walking by every once in a while. So I don't blame them for being a little shy. Those are our cichlids. Now I'm going to take you all around. I was super excited this morning when I got in. One of the first things I did was come over here around the corner. Where I'll take you all now. I wanted to come check on our green tree python. Our female had her pre-lay shed recently. You know what, I'm going to take you all all the way around here. She had her pre-lay shed. She is gravid. More cords. Come on over this way. So our green tree python is gravid. She ovulated a while ago, which is when her ova, her soon-to-be eggs, leave her ovaries and go into her ovaduct. Sometime in that process, those eggs were fertilized, and the ova became eggs. She then keeps them in her oviduct, where she shells them up. She puts a cal calcareous shell around them. It's not a huge amount of calcium because they aren't brittle hard eggs like turtle or chicken eggs. They're soft and leathery like most snakes or lizards have. But she's been laying that shell down and those eggs are getting close to being developed now. She's now had her pre-lay shed, so she should be laying those eggs any day now. So on Sunday, this is the female we're looking at here. You can see her nice, plump, swollen sides. Those are where her, she's got the eggs in there. You can see she's a bit blue now. Actually, this camera, if I can get focused there, showing those little tiny green diamonds running down her back there. Her skin, as she has become gravid, her hormones have changed. Some of the yellow pigment, pigment in her skin has faded away and it leaves her green looking a much more bluish hue and oftentimes then her baby pattern starts to stand out a little more. Those green diamonds that seem to run down her back there 
Those were the patterns she had when she was a little red baby. I expect these two to throw babies. They have babies that are, do not hatch green. They hatch yellow or red. And then as the snake grows and develops, they go through an ontogenetic color change, it's called, where they uh, change into their adult coloration. There we go, having a little connectivity issue. Hope I didn't lose you all there. I did lose you all. We're looking at our green tree python here. She's gravid. And on Sunday, I put this lay box in here. This is a fun lay box because I built it so that over on this side, I can get this light to change. It has a clear panel so we can actually look right in there. There's sphagnum moss in there. It's nice and dry. Green tree python eggs have to stay nice and dry. They need to be kept very hot. In very high humidity, but the eggs themselves need to stay dry. Most snake eggs can be buried in some moist vermiculite and stay moist that way and survive fine. And green tree python eggs typically will go bad when that happens. They'll begin to rot if, if moisture is allowed to touch the egg. There's our male hiding way up here, catching some good rays, basking a bit. I'm sure warming up under that light there. Yeah, so when I came in today, the female there, and that's her pre-lay shed next to her, that's the shed that she had to indicate that she'll lay her eggs soon. When I came in this morning, she was tucked away in this lay box in there deep, all coiled up. I was excited that I was going to get to be showing you all eggs today. And she wasn't laying eggs quite yet, just feeling things out, seeing if it's a comfy spot she wants to lay her eggs. I suspect that that is the spot she'll choose to lay them in. And then when she lays them, the last time she did, uh, the winter of 1819, she laid her eggs in there and I was so great that we could see her incubating her eggs, which is what they do. They stay coiled around their eggs and keep them nice and warm, monitor their temperatures with their heat sensing bits, and adjust their coils as necessary to hold more heat in or to try to release some heat. They're overheating. Um, so I tried to leave her on exhibit incubating her eggs. But unfortunately, one egg went bad for some reason. Maybe overheated. Or, uh, maybe it was a slug. Maybe it wasn't fertilized. I'm not exactly sure why the first one went bad, but it started affecting other eggs. And by the time I realized it, most of the eggs had been infected. There were a few that still looked good, so I tried pulling them out and setting them up in our incubator, but they did not survive. So this year, since no one is going to be here to see her incubating her eggs, I will pull them and as soon as they hatch, set them up in our incubator, and I have pretty high hopes that we'll end up with some baby green tree pythons this summer. Probably just in time for us to reopen and see what sort of temporary exhibit we can set up to show them off. Baby green tree pythons, as I mentioned, hatch a different color, bright red or yellow. They're really difficult to start feeding. In the wild, they're probably eating baby lizards or some creature besides a baby mouse, but all we have to offer them here are baby mice. And so it's a long, difficult, ongoing conversation to convince them to eat those baby mice than the lizards that they've evolved to eat, most likely. Perhaps insects. Not a whole lot is known about, about their natural history. There's a graduate student a number of years ago. His name is Matt Wilson. He did a bunch of work in the Cape York Peninsula with green tree pythons, learning about their behaviors found that females have pretty faithful territories, that males wander quite a bit, which is not an unusual trait. Males trying to find mates, and the females just hunkering down and staying in a place they know is safe. Anyways, those are our green tree pythons. And 
I think we'll wrap the tour up there. Thanks for joining me again. It's always fun to get to show our collection off. Tomorrow is the local Giving is Gorgeous campaign. It's run by GiveGab. It's an opportunity for local nonprofits to be able to try to raise some funds, which is ever important now with the coronavirus dealing with our society shut down to try to eliminate that virus from our population. So we could use your support. If you have the means to, please check out the givingisgorges.org website. It's easy to find the Science Center in there. This year our campaign, our fundraising campaign is centered around our animal room. When we've shut down, we've had to end so many of our programs. It's been difficult and heartbreaking, but one thing that we're not able to do, that the Science Center has stayed committed to, is maintaining this collection. It's a popular part of the museum. Many people, many kids and adults too, love to come and see our animals. And when we've shut down, we've still had to maintain this collection, both in paying for my time and one of our keepers' times, as well as all the supplies the food and the salt and the crickets that we need to, to keep this collection going. It's an expensive endeavor, but we feel like it's worth it. This collection has a lot to offer. So if you're willing to help support the collection, check out the Giving is Gorgeous website. And think about making a donation. I'd appreciate it. Now I'm going to take you all over to our Trout in the Classroom tank. Tomorrow is the Giving is Gorgeous campaign, though I believe you can donate now if you wanted to. But tomorrow, for our Zoom activity, tomorrow morning, our Keeper Emily is collaborating with the Discover Cuba Lake folks who run the Trout in the Classroom program, and they're going to do a release of some of our brown trout that we've been raising since last fall. It should be a really fun activity. I'm excited for those fish to get to swim free. We've put a lot of love and care into those little baby fish. It's been fun to watch them grow so large. So as soon as this tour is done, I'm going to wheel this camera over there so we can all take one last good look at our brown trout before they get released tomorrow. So again, check out Giving is Gorgeous. Stay safe and healthy and happy and enjoy the beautiful weather that's coming. Take care, and I'll see you... Thursday at 2 for another tour.